Good afternoon and welcome to our sunset safari and in particular a very warm welcome of Mrs. Ridges Club School. It's wonderful to have you on board with us this afternoon and we're very excited to hear all of the questions and comments that you have to make. My apologies for a somewhat gory start but we do have a wonderful afternoon planned for you ahead. My name is Jamie. I have VM on camera with me this afternoon. Brent is out with Dave on the other vehicle looking for other wonderful things to show you, but we just had to start with one of the most famous animals that is so stereotypically, stereotypically associated with South Africa. So we're coming to you live. What you're seeing is happening right here in the Sabi Sands, which falls under basically 4 million or close to 4 million hectares worth of unfenced wilderness area. That's bigger than some small countries and at the moment we're sitting with a group of males known as the Birmingham boys and their buffalo kill and look how pleased with himself he's looking. This gentleman has been looking exceptionally thin. His eye is quite swollen but we've got a male lion in his pride that has taken down a female buffalo. Now apparently this buffalo was actually killed by a group of five lionesses known as the Inkahuma Pride and they've been kicked off the kill <coughs> by the presence of these five young males. Now these young males are associating with this particular pride. They are dominant in this area and they do mate with them. But nevertheless they never miss an opportunity to steal a meal without having to work for it themselves. Now I hear that you've been chatting a lot about homeostasis within mammals and this is a really good example, having an African male lion sitting right in front of us to chat a little bit about the way in which they work. And there's a reason that male lions are often famed to be or thought of as lazy, always stealing the female's kill, making the females do all of the work. But the reason for that is they're about 100 kilograms, so to just over 200 pounds more than the females in body weight and they have those big thick manes around their necks. As you, I'm sure you know, the smaller your surface area to volume ratio, so the larger the animal, the harder it is for them to lose heat. So male lions can very easily overheat and that's one of the reasons why they only really participate in the hunts towards the end if they can get the females to do the work for them. That doesn't mean that they are not capable of hunting for themselves, they can but their body temperature cannot go up by more than a, look at that, look how thin he is. Shame boy, you've been in the wars. Their body temperature can't really go up more than two degrees Fahrenheit, unlike us. Look at this, I've never seen him in such bad condition. I wonder what's been happening. The rest of this group, known as the Birmingham Boys, are all looking a little bit beaten up and I think he's been recovering from an injury. And that's why he's lost as much condition as he has. His hip bones and his spine definitely shouldn't be sticking out like that. And none of the other boys are looking as bad. Our Kayla. Kayla is wondering what other plants and animals we might, might inhabit this area. And Kayla, I'm, ass I'm assuming you're talking in general, the enormous area that we have of wilderness. Kayla, we've got all of the members of the Big Five. We have, in other words, lions, rhino, elephant, buffalo and leopard. We also have cheetah, one of my personal favorite, the wild dogs, and my absolute personal favorite, the spotted hyena. There is also all manner of antelope species from impala and we get giraffe, zebra, wildebeest or brindled gnus as they are known in other parts of the world. We've got a tremendous amount of biodiversity. Just look at how he's panting here. All of that digestion of the meat is producing a tremendous amount of heat within his belly. And it's very typical for a predator out here to gorge themselves as rapidly as possible in order to, because you never know when your meal might be taken from you. So you want to try and get eat as much of it as quickly as possible, but that full belly that they, gain, that they gain after feasting on a buffalo will last only about two days before they have worked their way through it. 
Oh, and he's being plagued by flies as well. You can see how they're irritating him. His left eye is also really, really swollen. I mentioned that there were five of them, and because we can't, because there are lots of people that want to come and enjoy the sighting, we can't stay with them for as long as I would like to. So what I'm going to do is give you a quick tour and show you where the rest of them are. First of all, though, I want to show you something that I've just spotted now, and that is it wasn't just a female buffalo that they killed. Let me go forward ever so slightly. You should be able, can you see that from there, Vian? There we go. They've killed her calf as well. And there is absolutely nothing left of that baby buffalo except for the almost inedible hooves. That doesn't mean that those hooves will be wasted. At some point a hyena will come past and chomp on them and chew them. It was a very young buffalo. It must have been a brand new calf. Now the lions have made a complete meal of that little baby. Now the rest of them, I don't want to go too far, here is one here just lying off underneath the trees. You can just see him poking through the leaves. As I go forward you'll get a nice clear view. Here we go. You can see him panting away once again and flicking his ears to get rid of the flies. And then he's not looking nearly as thin as this other male, which leads me to believe that this male is his sort of bad condition and that thinness has been caused by an injury and not just a lack of food. So these five boys move together. They're not necessarily brothers. Some of them are cousins as well, but they've come from the same pride the same family when they were youngsters, which has led them to have very, very tight in them and actually given them a tremendous... You can just imagine how having five is far better than just two. There's another line off here, lying down in the bushes. And just before we started with your safari, there was another gentleman lying with him. I can't see where he's gone now. I think he's moved further back into the shade. Now this lion sitting in front of us panting, whilst he is exceptionally thin, will be fine. I know it looks, it is hard to see an animal in this sort of condition, but he will regain condition very rapidly now that his injuries have healed up. I've been watching the way that he walks. He doesn't seem to be limping too badly. It's just that he has been in some skirmishes. He's enjoyed his meal so much that he's actually dribbling down his chin. The king of the beasts is rather smelly this afternoon. His paws covered in buffalo. And speaking from direct first-hand experience, it is not a very pleasant scent that is coming from this buffalo. It's a combination of its stomach contents plus the feces of the lion. It definitely not what I would describe as a pleasant odour, but nevertheless good for them, especially good for this guy, that he managed to get a meal. Now, I mentioned that lions overheat very, very easily, and I'll leave it up to you guys to look into the biology of that and why it is that they do overheat like that. But there is a reason behind it. One of the reasons behind it is that we as human beings have evolved alongside these magnificent animals, and we've evolved to be the dominant diurnal predator of this particular area. So during the day, we are the dominant predator. We are above them in the food chain. That is the way we've, we've evolved. They've evolved to operate at night when it's much cooler. So that's one of the reasons why they overheat during the day. They are primarily nocturnal animals. And once night falls, that feeling that you get when you sort of want to be home at the end of the day, as it starts to get dark, that's a very, very instinctive response to a fear that we would have had a couple of hundred or tens of thousands of years ago when we lived out here with these lions. This is definitely a very special way to start off our afternoon. 
Unfortunately, we're only going to be able to stay here for a couple more minutes, but this gives me an opportunity to chat with some of the guides. In the meantime, let's find out how Brent's afternoon has gone, because apparently he's found the rest of the herd that this buffalo might have come from. So, welcome to the Sunset School Safari. My name is Brent and I have Dave on camera and we're with a massive herd of buffalo. They're probably, from my estimation here, uh, a good 300 or so. And this is a very, probably very similar to the type of herd that those lions would have caught. Those two out and welcome to Mrs. Rich's class. So, if you guys have any questions about buffalo, now, uh, very interesting animals. So, probably the closest thing we have to a cow out here. And they live in massive herds. Now, in terms of the ecosystem, they're very, very important. Now, uh, can you imagine? It's a large landscaping service. Not only do they mow the grass, they keep it nice and short. Uh, they also fertilize it as they go on. And their hoof action also turns over the soil enabling a nice place for seeds to take hold. Oh, sorry guys, I'm just causing a traffic jam, so I'm just going to loop around to where the buffalo are going to pop out. A lot of the buffalo there, this big windy weather is causing them to split a little bit. So, Paul is wondering where exactly in South Africa is the Kruger National Park, as you can see. There we go, we're catching up with the main body of the herd now. We're just with the stragglers earlier. So, Paul, we are in the eastern part of South Africa, uh, in the province, or what you would call a state, uh, called Impumalanga, which means where the sun rises, which is a very good name, in my opinion, for the eastern part. So we're just going to try to loop up ahead of the buffalo and then just stop and let them walk onto us. Hello, silly cows. And Paul was also wondering what surrounds the Kruger National Park. On the western side, it's surrounded by local communities. Uh, on the northern side, it's the international border between the country of Zimbabwe and South Africa. And then on the eastern side, the whole eastern boundary of the Kruger National Park is made up uh, of the country of Mozambique. The Kruger Park itself, including areas like the Sabi Sands, which we're in now, is about 2.7 million hectares. Um, and I will work out the exact acreage for you shortly, but it's roughly around eight or nine million acres, if my memory serves correctly. And it is part of what is called the Greater uh, Limpopo Transfrontier Park, which is 3.9 million hectares. So there are transfrontier parks that uh, join Zimbabwe and South Africa. So incredibly massive area all set aside for the protection of wild animals. I'm just trying to see. So Jewel is wondering are there giraffe in this area? Uh, Jewel, there most certainly are. Hopefully we will find one. We're just going to wait here. The buffalo are slowly moving towards us. They are in some round leaf teak thickets at the moment. Can you see any nicely, Dave? They're all quite far in there. Got a couple. Dave's got a couple. Um, and Jewel would also like to know how tall does a giraffe get? Jewel, a giraffe gets to about, a big male can reach about four meters. So there we go. Now, there's quite a lot of wind around at the moment and buffalo really don't like wind too much because what happens is their sense of smell and hearing is compromised a little bit. So they are unable to hear and smell as well as they would like. There we go, a jewel for you, a four meters for a giraffe is 13.12 feet so incredibly incredibly tall animal and the buffalo they're coming a bit closer through here so 
So guys, we're gonna stay with these buffalo. Hopefully they'll pop out onto the road. While we wait for that, Jamie's gonna have to say goodbye to the lions. So why don't you join her for that? We are going to have to leave these lines. Unfortunately, there are other vehicles that need to make their way in with their guests that want to enjoy the full safari experience. Mm -hmm. So for now, a nice, really nice starting to our afternoon. Some very full lines. Nice to see that this boy has got some food in him as well. And hopefully that will set him on the way to healing up. Other others all resting off in different parts of the shade underneath the trees. So just one last brief look before we move out. Okay, we're going to head out and find you other wonderful things. In the meantime, while I make my way out of the bush, we'll head back over to Brent. So we are back with the buffalo. They haven't quite got to us yet, but I have managed to find out exactly how big the wilderness area we're part of is, and obviously it's made up of different areas. It is 9,637,070 point, oh, there we go, um, no, sorry, 9.64 million acres is the close, just round it up, make it a bit easier. So, incredibly massive area. As you can see, the buffalo is slowly moving closer to us. Now, a big buffalo bull will weigh around 700 kilograms. And so, quite a bit bigger than your average cow. There are certain cow species that can get bigger than that now. So about 1,500 pounds, uh, but most of them, let's try a little bit forward, uh, will be around 1,200, 1,300 pounds, maybe even a little bit smaller for the females. Let's see if we pop our nose in there, if we can get a better view. So as I was saying, buffalo are one of your, what we call keystone species in an ecosystem. So if you remove your keystone species, there's a quite a quick and visible effect on the surroundings. So buffalo, as I said, are very important. They, like the elephants, are also very important. They are landscapers. Look at this, just buffalo everywhere. So as you can see, they'll come through an area like this, uh, keeping the grass short. And that's very, very important. And a lot of animals, specifically your other grazing animals like wildebeest, uh, and zebra like short grass. They don't like long grass. Wildebeest in particular is a very finicky feeder. Whereas buffalo are not, they are bulk grazers. So they keep the grass short, which keeps the other animals' numbers up as well. And of course, as I was saying, the hoof action, uh, just tilling the soil, basically like, imagine if you were going to prepare a seed bed for planting and you took your hoe and you dug it in and planted your seeds and you turned over the soil to give those seeds a good chance at germinating. That's what buffalo do out here in the bush. So Lauren's wondering, do we ever get a chance to touch any of the animals out here? Lauren, generally if you touch any of the animals out here, you end off very much second best. These are wild animals. Uh, we don't generally touch any of them if we can help it. The only time we tend to touch anything is probably uh, when I have to remove a snake from our house. That, is, that happens relatively often, um, but that's about the only time we will touch animals. Now, as nice as it sounds to be able to touch an African animal, and uh, there's a lot of places that let you hold lion cubs and stuff like that, those are very, very bad places, and often those animals are treated very badly. So if you really, really love animals, let them stay in the wild. I haven't managed to spot any little ones yet, but we'll keep looking. So Nick would like to know what biome we're in at the moment. So uh, he's asking, is it a grassland? Is it savanna? Is it desert? 
Well, it, in the general, there's a little baby well spotted, Dave. Uh, in general, it would be called a savannah, but this, this, if we get a little bit more specific, but since you're a biology class, that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, this is what you would call broad-leaved woodland. Uh, broad-leaved woodland, mostly made up of bush willow and combretum species. Here we go. Now, baby buffalo have a very unique feature that a lot of other animals don't have. It's one of the few animals that can feed on the move, a baby buffalo. So while the buffalo herd is moving, and they do move big distances, specifically big herds like this, so obviously if they stayed in one place, they would finish all the grass. So they, what they do is they slowly move between water and grazing, and are on constantly on a big sort of loop through different areas. Now a baby buffalo is able to suckle by standing between mom's two back legs. So as they're walking wherever they might be going, that baby buffalo is able to, to suckle. Unfortunately for the baby buffalo, it does put it in the firing line, so to speak. So it's not uncommon to see baby buffalo um, with mom's uh, pat on their head. And now the herd is actually slowly going to surround us. So I'm going to get Dave to start over here. So this actually might be a bit more than 300. So I think this is a slightly bigger herd than we last saw. So we're going to start there and we're going to pan across. Now just keep looking everywhere there's the buffalo. And you can see them there. Isn't this absolutely amazing, guys? And we go, keep going. And all the way around us, you can see the buffalo. And they're even behind the other vehicles, so there's even buffalo behind us. Now, if we sit here for long enough, we're probably going to be engulfed by these buffalo. Now, one last quick interesting fact for you guys. Let's go straight onto this guy there, onto his horns. There. Now you can, no, a little one lower, the one with his head down. There we go. Now you can see it looks like that buffalo has been rubbing his horns on something. And uh, of course, being an animal out here, they get pestered by flies and ticks. And they don't have hands and fingers like we do to scratch. They often use trees. But in this particular case, uh, they will rub his horns against a tree called the Timberti tree, which is highly noxious. It's got a poisonous milky latex, and that works as a natural insect repellent to keep the flies away and also helps with the ticks and other arachnid parasites like mites. And you can see there's a female. She doesn't have that very well, big, well-developed boss. So guys, it's been a great having you. Uh, Mrs. Ridge's biology class. I hope we'll have you on safari with us, as, with us again soon. Uh, but for now, I hope you guys enjoy. And if you get a free moment, come watch Safari Live in your free time. So welcome back to everyone else, and isn't it amazing that we're able to impart a joy and wonder for nature here on the live drives and showing and bringing the safaris to schools in the US at the moment. It does give us a happy, warm feeling to be breeding the next generation of conservationists. So unfortunately, you're just gonna hear a bit of beeping. Uh, Dave is going to put on the virtual reality rig uh, while these buffalo engulf us. Uh, we'll be with you in a second. I'm just waiting for Dave. There we go. Okay, we're not going to clap now. We'll clap at the end because we are surrounded by buffalo. So as you can see, as I said, I thought there were about 300. I think they might be closer to 500, which is a very big herd for the Sabi Sands. And they are spread out for probably about 500 meters around us, all the way down to where we came from, near Buffalsook Dam. And this is absolutely amazing. Buffalo to the left of us, buffalo to the right. And you can see they're on the move already, and they have to keep moving, and they're just taking advantage of this green flush of grass. And it's amazing how quickly these animals have picked up condition. After looking very, very skinny and not so healthy, these buffalo have picked up condition very, very quickly. 
Something spooked those ones over there, a little bit of a stampede. I think someone got a horn in the bottom. Look at them go. Now, we're by, we might see some serious herd mentality here, where one runs, all run. Listen to that. I'm just going to keep quiet. Now, when you actually hear them being chased by lions, it is literally deafening. It's a roar as they stampede through the bush. Barbara on Twitter says we haven't been seeing buffalo for quite a while, but now we're making up for it. So they are, they just came for a quick visit and we can see a lot of bottoms heading to the east across our edge of our traverse. There's a nice little baby there. A very old female who's had that baby. You can see by the gnarled horns. There you go. Hello, little guy. And look at that swarm of flies around them. There's a very pregnant cow in front of us, Dev. There we go. And you look at her. She looks like she's about to pop. Now, buffalo is one of the animals I actually have seen give birth on quite a few occasions, probably 15 or 16 times even. We used to spend a lot of time with big buffalo herds when I was younger in Botswana. And the biggest herd in living memory, or in, since they actually started recording those type of things, I was lucky enough to see. And uh, it was just under 5,000 individuals. So when we reported the, this herd, the Botswana government was so fascinated, they put up an aeroplane that took aer aerial photographs of those, here we go, hello buffs, of those, of that herd. And then some poor student had to literally go through the aerial photographs and count every single individual dot. But it was just under 5,000. Oh, tiny baby, a couple of days old, still looking a bit wobbly. Barbara was saying we hadn't seen many buffalo, but we sure are making up for it. So Barbara, with these big herds, they're, they're constantly on the move, uh, and that is in search of grazing and water, but it's very good that they are on the move. So as I said, mobile fertilizer systems, they also turn up the grass nicely. And I think they are slowly departing Cindy in Florida is wondering, can a buffalo ever have twins? I'm sure it is possible, just very, very unusual. Cindy, you don't find twins happening too often in a lot of wild animals. Of course, it's double the amount of pressure on the mother uh, in what she's got to rear. And look, you can see the, even see the bolus on that female. Oh, no, she swallowed it. But she was chewing a cud there, and you could all, there we go, have a look there. You can see the bolus she's brought up from her, one of her four stomachs. So obviously being a ruminant, four, a four, it's not really four different stomachs, it's four chambers of the same stomach system. But it enables these grazing species to get the best out of what they eat uh, and leave very little nutrients uh, at the back. Well, I think the last of the herds crossing here, I think the rest of them actually crossed behind us. And all of a sudden there's this massive gale that's blowing. It is also very humid, and I'm wondering if we're in for a storm this evening. There we go. Diane is wondering, are the Inkahuma pride still around, possibly trying to hunt some of these buffalo? Well, Diane, the Inkahumas were successful in hunting buffalo. And look at them dash off there. That's the last of them. Oh, there's a straggler on the right. Whoop, there we go, an older cow. Oh, she's got a bit of a limp. Back left ankle looks broken. And that would explain why she is the straggler. But uh, Diane, the Nkumas were successful. 
Uh, as far as I know, you might have jumped on drive a little bit late today, but the report, I'm pretty sure, quite accurate, that all five in Kaumas and there were five Birmingham's on that buffalo kill Jamie was at earlier. So they're happy. They killed a buffalo cow and a calf. So I don't think we're going to be seeing the Nkuhumas after this particular herd. So bye-bye buffalo as they move off into Torchwood. I am going to continue the never-ending search for Queen Karula. So last tracks I had were in this area here. So we're going to head back down there. So Orion in the Netherlands is wondering where can he find all these VR recordings. Uh, I think the place to look is on the Safari Live YouTube channel. And I think not all of them are up yet. They're still in post-production, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to find them there. I think there is definitely one of Jamie up so far. So go have a look on the Safari Live YouTube channel. I just have to let the other guys know where those buffalo have headed. Uh, leaving that large herd of buffalo slowly mobile east on the firebreak between Buffalo's Hook and Gowrie Cutline. Okay, let's go see what we can find. So, very interesting about Tingana, who we were tracking this morning, that big male leopard. He was chasing. Down. Sorry, just listening here. Yeah. Continue to fumble down the drainage in a bit of an easterly direction. Interesting, um, very interesting. Uh, I haven't really seen him on the way. So, Tangana is not where they left him this morning. He seemed to be heading back east, uh, maybe going in search of that other male leopard that he chased. Unfortunately, yeah. they had such a brief view of that male leopard that they were unable to get an ID on it. The wild dogs were left lying up in the same place they were found this morning. So fingers crossed they decide to come visit us again this sunset safari. So a big safari live welcome to Verona in Johannesburg. Verona would like to know how often do we see buffalo on our live safaris? Well, Verona, we see buffalo bulls probably every safari, uh, but these big herds of buffalo like we've just encountered, we'll probably see if we're lucky once a week during the dry season. And now while it's lovely and green, probably once every two or so weeks. But they are around and you never know when they might pop up again. So while we continue to search for the elusive leopard, uh, let's go to Jamie, who's got a bird of prey. Look at this. We have a bird of prey currently investigating a termite mound. And this is something we've been seeing relatively often in terms of since the rain, the termite mound population explosions, the reproductive termites, this particular individual is taking full advantage of whatever the termite mound has to offer. A dark eye and very, really, very really dark in colour. Actually, initially, immediately thought it was a Warburg's eagle, one of the dark morphs of Warburg's eagles. But I'm changing my mind on that. I just want to check something quickly in my book. It's a little bit big. We're quite far away from it, but it looks a little bit too big to be a Wahlberg's eagle. Got a very dark eye. And a gape that extends all the way back behind the eye, which immediately made me think of Step Eagle. We just haven't seen that many of them. There's not enough. No, could well be. I think it is actually a step eagle. It's the right shape. It's got the right posture. It's just that little bit too far away to get a sense of scale. And there's 
that is absolutely awesome to see. There's also one sitting up in a dead tree just off to my right, which I'll show you now. The clouds building up in the skies behind. This is not a, an eagle, this is one of the snake eagles. In fact, it looks like it might be a brown snake eagle just from this position. There's a very definite rain feeling in the air. So these birds of prey might have more luck on the termite front. Just look at that sky. There's a very ominous feel to it. And I think, I'm, I think I was wrong. I think that I might, I think that we may actually have some more rain before we go into our dry season. I honestly thought that we were done with rain for this particular year, but that doesn't seem to be the case at all. I know that lots of you are keen to see the Arethusa Dam and to just get a bit of a perspective. I'm also, since I'm here, I would very much like to just investigate and see how much water is in it. I haven't been since the start of the rain. Be interesting to go and investigate. I'm sure that lots of you had several questions about that Birmingham boy sighting that we have. Now, Hubby Cub, you wanted an update on the dam. You wanted an update on Weir Teller's dam. But we're on our way to the Arethusa Dam instead, but I'm sure that at some point one of us will drive past the Buyatella Dam during our drive. So Hush Cub will keep an eye out for you. I just wanted to correct something that was said earlier. I was given the message that the Inkahumas had killed that buffalo. I've just spoken to some of the guides here and they said that they haven't seen the Inkahumas at all. So perhaps though I was right about them being somewhere on Juma in the Mulawati drainage line. Their tracks were heading in that direction this morning and I haven't seen any tracks. That's why I was very confused when I was first given that message because I haven't seen any tracks of females crossing towards Arethusa. We started off our morning with the two, three Birmingham boys wandering south along that division between Juma and Arethusa. It was a spectacular sighting. They're all looking distinctly beaten up though. One of them, as you saw, is exceptionally thin the thinnest I've ever seen him and the rest of them covered in a variety of scrots, sc scratches and scars. Brent thinks that there's a possibility they might have had a run-in with the Salati males or at least that was what all of the noise was about early this morning. Something that we'll just never know whether or not that is the case. Steph who ask, actually asked us is it possible is there a possibility that the Birmingham males had a fight with the Majingilan males? It is, but it's fairly unlikely, Steph. The reason I told I say that is because as you know, the Oopsie Daisy. Hmm. That's um very broken. Gremlins. Gremlins. <laughs> Fim says it's the gremlins, <laughs> wood gremlins, unlike our technological and mechanical ones. Wood gremlins, quite possibly also known as termites. It would be another name for wood gremlins, I suppose. That sounds about right. So the reason I said that it's, it might not be the Majingilans is because although they came all the way towards Simbabili, which is very close to our property, they then turned around and went straight back southwest to their usual area. So whilst it is entirely possible, it's probably more likely to have been the Salati males. Here we go. So this is an update on the Arethusa Dam. This is what the Arethusa Dam is looking like from above. A 
this is a lovely spot to come and sit and watch the birds. I'm trying to see if I can find any. Also, I haven't seen any hippos. Did you see any hippos, Viam? I don't think I see any hippos. It's unusual for Arethusa. Unless, is that a hippo there? Mm. Just get my binoculars out for a second. So Darlene, you were wondering, I mentioned that this is a nice spot to come and look at birds. That's definitely not hippos. Actually looks like a pile of plant material. Darlene, you were wondering if you could tell individual bird species whilst tracking or whether or not you are limited to basically perching versus and or passerines versus ground birds. And Darlene, you can. Now it's something that Rennie has tested us on. Some of them are more difficult than others, but you can tell the difference between doves and starlings. Little passerines, so little perching birds like, for example, robins and larks and cysticulars, any birds like that, it is far more difficult to tell, nigh on impossible, to tell the difference between the different species. But as for the rest of them, most of our distinctive birds leave distinctive tracks that are as different from each other when you get down to the nitty gritty details as leopard and lion and hyena tracks are to each other. It's just a matter of where you put your focus. Darlene, what I'll try and do is we'll try and find a nice muddy pan that we can look at the tracks on and investigate the different bird species. And it would be interesting to do. And there's different ways in which the birds walk. For example, the lapwings with their three toes and a missing back toe. But I'm not going to go into too much detail now. I'm going to see if I can find you a nice example. While I do, Brent has found our largest animal on the reserve. So we've come across some elephants. And as you, the regulars will know, we spend quite a lot of time very close to elephants. But as we drove up to these elephants, they probably about 40, 50 meters away from us now. Uh, the female immediately displayed signs of discomfort. Her tail went rigid, uh, so we're not going to attempt to go any closer to them. I'm hoping that they will move out into the open a little bit. Now this strong, gusting wind we're experiencing could have something to do with it. I'm just gonna move a bit forward. We might be able to see the other one. So. One must remember that even the same herd of elephants that could be 100% relaxed this morning might have had a run-in with a must bull or, or something that will cause them to be not so comfortable in the evening. But here, there's a, the rest of a section of the herd, a different section of the herd. And we're just going to stay a little bit further away. Look, you can see already. You see that tail upright and erect? This is a young one, so we don't take too much notice of them. But it, it was a nice little show of uh, body language there. So an elephant's tail, for me, is one of the most important things to watch uh, to not get yourself into any trouble. Now, as soon as the tail becomes rigid and starts standing up, it is a sign that they are not happy with you or not even happy with your presence. Young one like this, it could just be a bit of bravado. So as you can see, the tail's gone down now as soon as we stop the car. So we've stopped a little bit further away from what we normally would and I just want to see if the rest of the herd is also feeling as slightly put out as the original female we saw who's disappeared into the bush. I'm hoping not and we'll see if they decide to give us a wide berth we'll do the same. No need to force the issue. It is always awesome to spend time with these animals. Hi. Deborah, the armchair traveler, says she can't believe how beautiful and green it is. It's lovely. It's hard to think not even a few weeks ago, Deborah, we could barely see anything in terms of greenery. The ground was bare and barren. So I'm just watching. Let's see, she doesn't seem to be taking too much notice of us. 
But still, I, with this strong wind blowing around, I'm going to hang back for a little bit longer before I make my call whether we can approach these guys a little bit closer. Oh, I forgot to tell all the other game drives there's some elephants around. Wondering, what is my opinion on zoos? What is the difference between an area like this and a zoo in terms of pr protecting animals. So see, to be 100% honest, I'm not a huge fan of zoos. Uh, in, I believe in most cases, there are better options. I but if you look at the animals in the zoo, they're just, they're just not the same as the ones out here. Uh, specifically the big cats, they just pace. They're very, very bored and also the, the large primates. Even the elephants, uh, you can just see there's just a far better quality of life out in a place like this. Even though they get sick, they die, people don't help them, I just think the animals lead a much better life than they would in a captive environment. So, now, as I say, if you really like wild animals, let them remain wild. And the same goes for pet birds and all those things. Now, behind having a pet bird, there's an a massive illegal bird trade that started the initial pet trade in birds and inbreeding and all sorts of stuff. So, and I never like to see a bird in a cage. I like to see them out in the wild. And the same goes for these guys, uh, particularly when they're going to get a little bit naughty like this. I love the different characters elephants have. So we can definitely see the different individual characters and elephants in the herds we see a lot. But it is quite nice and easy to spot someone who might give us a little bit of fun, like this one. Might give us a little head shake as she gets close. Oh, he gets close, sorry. There we go, on cue. You're a clever boy. hear them calling, talking to each other in that low rumble. Look at this big female coming. Oh. Now, she's a little bit not relaxed and it's very difficult to explain how I can see that to you. Because there's no real obvious signs, like the obvious signs I've talked about. Just suddenly saw a little bit of a stiffness in her neck. And we're just gonna keep very, very still, Dave, when she comes past. Everything should be 100%. Very, very still, no quick movements on the camera. Here we go, wasn't that amazing? So quite often, because I stopped a little bit further away, uh, because I stopped a little bit further away, even though the herd was initially unrelaxed and we, we've parked and let them come to us, not the other way around. And also we're not moving around quickly, we're not making a lot of noise. And so even though you could just, I could just sense a little bit of stiffness in her neck and in her legs, but she wasn't a hundred percent comfortable, but she still passed. Unlike this, you can just see, this has got not a worry in the world. Don't get naughty. Don't smell my tires. Don't. Yes, stop it. Now that was just curiosity and you can see, I don't know if you guys could pick up the difference in the body language between those two different elephants. Uh, the little ones like this, they're just full of the joy of life and quite curious. Wasn't that special? I really love spending time with elephants. And it's amazing, I've spent probably thousands of hours with elephants in my, in my life and I never get tired of it. And it's so interesting. I can learn something new about body language and movement just by watching them constantly. Now, I'm not going to follow the herd, even though that they are going down the road. There is this strong wind around. They're not 100% relaxed. So there's no need to push our luck. We had 
an absolutely incredible experience. That elephant, or the little elephant last, I, if I'd wanted to, I probably could have leant out and touched it. Of course, I'm not going to, but that was magic. And we're going to move on and see if we can find any tracks of the Queen of Juma or any other fascinating creature that's out here. You guys are going to get me into trouble today We're talking about controversial things. Um, Paula, Alexandra, and Olivia would like to know my. on rampage and killing people in cities and stuff like that. And unfortunately, the one way to make an animal that big completely submissive of you is to terrify it in one way or another so I personally am I personally am not not a huge not and not even a fan at all there's no fan involved in elephant back safaris lion cub petting lion walking any of that type of stuff now those are very of course very different from, from zoos and, and zoos in some cases uh, do have a very important scientific and educational value uh, whether those are for neither those are for profit it looks like those storms might have blown off so we might make it through without getting wet Sabrina, who's 12, says so she's been volunteering at a zoo on her weekends. And they say they're helping a giraffe mom and baby by keeping the dad away. Will giraffe do this in the wild? Well, Sabrina, not really. Again, you're looking at, a, at, a, at an unusual circumstance there. Uh, normally, a male giraffe in the wild would probably get bored of trying to harass the female. But of course, they're in an enclosed environment, so he's got nowhere else to go. They've got nowhere else to go. So in those circumstances, it would be best for that, in that situation, to, to, to separate them. But in the wild, he'd have lots of other lady giraffes to go court. So he wouldn't probably take too much attention to a youngster. I have seen giraffe females sort of ward off the males from, uh, from babies. But not that often, and normally there's enough other distractions around to keep the male away from harassing the baby and the, the new the new mum. What did I do with my spogo? Here we go. So, those of you wondering what a spogo is, that is the Zulu name for a hat or a cap. It's a spogo. Who can say that? If you can say, this is Ogo, put it on a video, pop it on Facebook or YouTube. Let's have a look if you can say, this is Ogo. This is Ogo. Well, well done, Dave. So the birds seem to be quite quiet. And there is a very obvious reason for that. This gusting wind, quite a lot of the bird species are going to be hunkering down. So maybe we'll get some joy with some birds down in the Mwati River. in Florida it says she understands what I'm saying about zoos but she says the animals are dying in the wild uh, from poaching so what do we do when we lose them well cat this is a very <laughs> very, very controversial uh, topic and 
there's lots of different things and of course there are in certain cases there is a need uh, for human intervention and, and, and protecting certain species but if we can avoid keeping them in captivity I really think we should and then there's a very big difference between a zoo and a, a sort of secure zone so I know for a fact inside certain reserves at the heart of the reserve um, for rhinos in this particular case they've fenced off a separate area it's still not a zoo it's still much bigger uh, that area will probably still be twice the size or three times the size of your whole average zoo uh, so there are other ways and means uh, but I, I do understand there is a need for education and for and for conserving of certain species and also for research so it's far less invasive to do blood work and genetic research and stuff on a zoo animal that is very used to human contact than it is on a wild animal which has to be put to sleep and stuff so I'm just saying I do understand Okay, so guys, this is the last question we're doing on this topic, and then we're going to move on to, to other stuff. Uh, so, S Safari Dean is wondering about Kevin Richardson, uh, who has a whole bunch of lions in captivity. Now, those, it's, those are a very different story, uh, and I've actually worked quite a bit with Kevin. So, when Kevin initially got involved in that industry with the, the lion taming and wrangling and petting etc um, he was a little bit naive and stuff and it, it didn't take him too long uh, to figure out what was going on so Kevin's lions that he has got now have been taken away from an environment where they probably would have gone into canned lion hunting or sterile they cannot he is not trying to get those lions from old, from old age it's done he's not going to try to collect any more lions there's a gremlin in the so as I say Kevin Kevin started off where he's ended more as emblems and and for the anti-lion uh the lion canned lion hunting uh for lion conservation in general but he's not trying to breed more he's not trying to uh, get more cubs all the time so it's a, it's a very different situation as i said and kevin i've had long chats with him about this obviously and when those lions are dead they're dead he's not getting any more and so that that is a big major difference to places that are constantly uh, breeding lions or getting more animals uh, so a very different thing and as again I said we can discuss all things till, till, uh, till the end of the year and beyond for the next 10 years uh, there will always be these, these controversial issues but let's move off those and have a look at some buffalo wallowing in a mud wallow quickly So, now, these boys are the old gentlemen. So we saw that wonderful big breeding herd at the beginning of the safari. Now, these are the guys who, who can't cut it anymore. Uh, the competitive mating inside those big breeding herds. So they choose to spend their days wallowing, chewing the cud, and looking at me like I owe him money. Now, there's an old saying about buffalo uh, buffalo bulls they always do seem to look at you like you owe the money the debt collector so 
So Marianne in Arkansas is being very, very observant. Uh, there's some oxpeckers there, because that's what Marianne's chatting about. She said there was a lack of oxpeckers on those buffalo earlier. Oh, that's a juvenile. Oh, where'd he go? To the next buffalo. Uh, Marianne, they were there, but they were flying up overhead while they were moving. So quite often the oxpeckers really like these old boys because they're very stationary. Whether it's on those big herds when they're up and moving, the oxpeckers will be there, but it's much harder for them to feed easily while they're constantly moving through the bush. But there were some oxpeckers, but definitely not nearly the amount we often see uh, on these old boys. There you go, oxpecker to the right. Oh no, he's, and the bull's trying to shake him off. And they can become quite irritating. There he is on his nose. Oh, and looking for those ticks around the eyes and ears. Now, interestingly enough, this is a red bulled oxpecker. Um, oxpeckers can eat buffalo earwax. How strange is that? So they have an enzyme in their stomach that enables them to digest earwax of the larger animals that they feed off. And I've always wondered why. And I think it's probably got to do something with uh, some sort of The life of the, the lions. And you can see very, very old, losing quite a lot of their his skin around his eyes. Isn't that wonderful? They're very happy that we've now had a bit of rain. They don't have to share with Pete the pond hippo and have elephants interrupting their slumbers. There's enough water around for everyone now. So we're going to leave these buffalo and head back towards the area around Juma where there were some impala alarm calls apparently during the day. So who knows what could have caused those impala to have a panic. And while we do that, let's go see what Jamie has been up to. Jamie's on her way towards Treehouse Dam, thinking just in general about checking out the various waterholes. Also wondering whether or not we'll be lucky enough to bump into the Inkahumas. If they, since their tracks don't seem to go out of Juma. Also just thinking about the question we got on bird tracks from Darlene. And I thought maybe somewhere around the mud here would be a good place to have a look. But first I want to just have a show you that very large hinge terrapin that is sitting on the bank. I don't want to go any closer because I think he's going to take a dive as soon as we do. Peacefully surveying the dam. That is a big terrapin for the size of our general size of terrapins that we get out here. He's probably, I'd love to know exactly how old he is. Over 10, probably over 20 years old. They grow a bit faster than tortoises do. Lots of Movement. What is what is there? The like monitor. monitor lizard. All spotted VM. Awesome. Having a swim. There was a brief moment where I thought crocodile, which is not impossible, but it was unlikely. Let's go forward a bit. We'll get to see him. Hopefully, we'll get to see him actually come out of the water and onto the bank. All spotted VM. Very well done. VM's got a, a monitor spotting talent, actually. Is he? Oh, there he is. I think he's about to. Is he about to alight upon the bank? He is. Where the the green grass is on the edge of the water. He, yeah, the one on the left. To the left there. There's his head. Perfect. Thank you. This is probably a water monitor lizard, rather than a rock monitor. Now that might seem really self-explanatory when you're looking at it swimming in the water. But both species are very, very at ease. 
swimming. Uh, although the water monitor does spend a bit more time around water, it could be either of them. In this case though, just even from a distance, not quite as brightly colored as a rock monitor. In South Africa, we call them legavans. From the Afrikaans, legavan. Oh, there he goes. There he's going to come out. Awesome. He's a big guy. Tongue flickering. He's pulling that scent in. Is he going to go back in? Definitely a water monitor. I will show you the difference in my book in a moment once we've lost him. Very prehistoric, looking for potential prey, little fish maybe, possibly frogs as well, would definitely fall on his menu or her menu. Very difficult to tell the sex of a monitor lizard. It could also be cooling off a little bit as well on this hot day. Indecisive, scouring, oh, got something. What did he get? He got, he got something. What is that? Frog, that maybe. Could be a, could well be a frog. Let me try and double check with my binoculars. Could be a frog. Could also be, uh, I've lost him now. There he is. Could have been a frog, might even have been a mussel of some kind or a freshwater crab. Looks like a frog to me. That's exciting. Just as we were talking about what he might be searching for, he found something. I'm fairly certain it's a... Oh, he dropped it. He got it again. I'm fairly certain it's a frog looking through my binoculars. Looks like a frog. Oh, I would I think about repositioning and getting closer, but unfortunately, I think all that will do is scare him off. We're right and we could go around to the other side of the bank, but I don't think that's going to do us any favors. He'll just duck back into the water and hide away from us. And I also don't want to distract him from his afternoon snack, which he seems to be finishing off. In fact, I think he might even have finished it already. I definitely thought I saw a frog leg through my binoculars. Perusing the edges of a pan, a perfect place to come and hunt. They are so prehistoric looking in the way that they move. Now those tails are exceptionally powerful, which is one of the things that gives them that very easy swimming ability, very natural way of moving through the water. And he's found sniffing around for something else. They've also got slightly slight webbing around their toes, very, very slight. But that tail, having been whipped before by a monitor lizard that I was trying to catch and remove from a house, is, I can speak from experience, it is much stronger than it looks. They're also capable of flicting, inflicting quite serious bites. You can see the fishes splashing in front of him. Sorry, I was just listening to the Game Drive channel there. Now, Donna, I said that that terrapin was particularly large, and you were wondering just how big it really was. Now, to give you a, a sort of a sense of scale, I'm trying to think of a nice comparison for you, Donna. About, hmm, 
about the size of half a coconut, a large, I mean, I don't mean a coconut like we get them when we eat them, I mean an actual coconut with the skin and everything, about half the size of that, that's such an absurd comparison, I don't know why I can't now think of anything that would be useful. Donna, I'll show you with, a, with my hands to scale in a moment, but I don't want to tear my eyes away from this monitor lizard. Half the size of a soccer ball. If you cut a soccer ball in half, that was the size of the terrapin. Let's go with that, Donna. That's probably the best comparison I can give you. I just want to see if this monitor lizard manages to catch anything else. I'm very clearly on a hunting mission. Investigating all the crevices and likely spots where it might find another frog or a fish or something similar. Not sure how, but Brent has somehow acquired my reptile book. I don't think it's his fault though, I think I left it when I swapped cars. But that does mean, unfortunately, that I can't show you the difference between rock monitors and water monitors. I think we'll have, we can definitely ask Brent to do that for you at some stage in his drive, since he might have it with him. But essentially, a rock monitor has much more vivid and colorful markings than this water monitor does. Fascinating animals. You can see the ear openings as he moves through the water. Those, of course, capable of closing, opening and closing, depending on whether or not his head is submerged. He's coming slowly closer to us, and I think that's what's giving him the slightly nervous look. It's amazing. If I, if I didn't know that he was there, if I was not looking through this, through the camera, or looking at my monitor, of this view through the camera. I would never know that he was there. It's just his head poking out. Keeping a watchful eye on us. That's awesome. <laughs> Cat in Florida. My binoculars are slightly, slightly better than James's. They have taken a beating over the years. They're a bit dirty. They were a gift from my dad when I first went into this um, guiding profession. So over time they have collected a considerable amount of dirt, but they are an essential tool out here in order to guide properly, not just to look at the different bird species, but animals. It gives you a nice closer perspective if you want to look at injuries on animals, for example. Now what I'm doing now, since our monitor lizard is not keen on getting any closer with us in the vicinity, is I'm looking for a nice bird track in the mud. And you got some there. Is that is that a good position? Or should Please, I go sir. back a bit? Perfect. There we go. How's that? That for somebody who asked Arlene who asked about bird tracks. That is a lapwing track. Uh, you'll note that there's only three toes in front and in fact let me get off the vehicle so that I can demonstrate exactly what I mean. Oh goodness, there's a storm brewing. There is definitely a storm on its way. I will just go and have a quick look. Oh, you can hear how the wind is howling. The storm's coming. So Via managed to spot these little tracks in the mud relatively thick toes and you'll see that there's no back toe. Now all of the birds that walk constantly on the ground don't have a back toe. So the lapwings, the dickorps, anything like that would normally, their toe actually sits a little bit higher. So Franklins are the same and guinea fowl are the same. Now just judging by the size and the shape of this track and the way that the toes are positioned and the length of the distance between this track Ooh, it's a bit smelly this mud and this track. You can see that whatever bird made it had relatively long legs to have such a long stride in the mud. Oh, there we go. Um, oh well, not going to do me any harm. It's just a little bit mucky. And just while I'm here, I also want to stop and have a look at this algae that is in one of the puddles. It's one of the more it's an unusual sight. It's not, it's, it's not completely unusual, but it's not one that we see very often. Wow. 
the storm is very rapidly blowing in. I wonder if we're not going to get some rain sooner than expected. There's a dip to the temperature. But this is the algae I wanted to show you. We get very used to seeing green algae. Unfortunately, the light has changed. Oops, sorry, roll backwards a bit. The light has changed, so you can't quite see just how blood red this water is. And it's due to the red algae that is inhabiting it. Now, most plants are green because chlorophyll, the molecule that is responsible for photosynthesis, or the pigment that is responsible for photosynthesis, is green in color there is however another molecule and for the life of me i cannot remember its name but it is red and it is more capable of absorbing red light or the the, the light rays that are red in the spectrum so the longer light rays and that's what this algae is utilizing in this particular puddle it's such a fascinating creature algae evolved what's it algae evolved was it three billion years ago in theory and it actually was what gave shape to, there we go, we've actually got the color coming through relatively nice. Let me go back a little bit so that we get the tree shading it. There you can see it looks like blood in this puddle. And algae actually changed the atmosphere. The, the arrival of algae changed the atmosphere in our world before it had very, very much higher concentrations of carbon dioxide and slightly lower concentration of oxygen than it does now. And slowly, slowly through the gradual photosynthesis respiration process that algae goes through, it was able to gently shift the atmospheric conditions and the different percentage of the gases within the atmosphere to the point that it became possible for other forms of life to survive. And it has continued unchanged for billions of years. One of those fascinating little overarching views of the way in which life works out here. That is just one of the examples. That's a pleasure, James Richards. I always enjoy a good reptile sighting as, sighting as well. I'm also hoping for a crocodile sighting one of these days. And actually, if I get to a good spot on this dam wall, he's chosen the exact point at which the dam has collapsed slightly. How's your view from there, Vian? He's still there, watching us intently. Definitely, I'm always hoping for a sighting, James, of the crocs basking in the sun. And it's always a possibility. interesting point from Debbie. This particular reptile has a forked tongue, as do most snakes. Debbie was wondering, how does a forked, as opposed to um, a sort of a single tongue, help in terms of smelling? Debbie, that is a really interesting question. So, the reason we have two ears, apart from the fact that we're very bilateral symmetric, symmetrically, and two eyes, is it gives us a perception of depth. So, the way that we see with our vision allows us, having two eyes allows us to focus and get a depth perception. The way that we hear, our brain automatically thinks about the way in which the time it's taken, even if it's just a split second for a sound to hit one ear. Sooner than the other, or louder in one ear and softer in the other. Forked tongue is exactly the same principle. So the concentration of smell that they get, they can pick up the minutest difference on each side of that tongue. And essentially that allows them to see, you know, if you imagine it as seeing the smells, it allows them to see the trail that is left and get a direction of that scent. So something that is unique to reptiles and really, really interesting. Just look at this. This is amazing.
We've spoken about the fact that monitor lizards of both the rock and the water kind are very capable of moving both through water and through land. But Ellen was wondering, where would a water monitor lizard live in times when, especially when the, when the pans and the dams and the water holes have dried up? And he's, he's actually, I think he's, oh, I thought he was going to come out, but he changed his mind. He's thinking about it. Oh, there's our first rumble of thunder. Isn't he beautiful in his own way? Ellen? They live in crevices of rocks, crevices of trees. They can live within termite mounds as well. The cowrie stops and sniffs each vegetation patch. There you can see that forked tongue at work. Long tongue. So they don't necessarily, they're not in any way reliant on the water in the same way the fishes are or crocodiles might be. They're equally capable of hunting on land, foraging through trees, eating birds, eggs, or small birds. They're actually fairly ferocious, ferocious predators. And in fact, a small crocodile, a newly hatched crocodile, would also be on the menu for these rock monitor lizards, or this water monitor. He's found a safe spot now. I don't think he's going to move too much further from there. He's hidden himself behind the bush. And that generally is where our different lizard species live. I must tell you, the atmosphere at the moment, this is like a true, this is what a true summer afternoon should really be like. There's this intense, almost electric feel to the air. The storm is advancing. And Janet, Yes, to a certain extent, a crocodile is a type, almost a type of lizard. And Janet, I'm going to answer that question, but I'm actually going to move off this dam wall while I do. It's very, very narrow perspective, so I'll answer as I drive along. Thank you very much, Rock Monitor, for that sighting. So, Janet, a crocodile is... I said it is to an extent, it's not really. It is a completely separate species and it is one of the oldest reptiles in the world and is probably one of the closest relatives to the birds, funnily enough. As you know, birds and crocodiles share a common ancestor through the dinosaurs. So it is, you can sort of think about it as a type of lizard, but there's a lot of differences to it. I suppose it's it's, it's related to lizards in the same way wild dogs are related to lions. They are actually fairly distinct species. We wouldn't call them a large species of lizard in the same way a Komodo dragon, for example, or indeed a rock monitor, is a species of lizard or a type of lizard. As I said, closest relative to a crocodile, rather than being the other reptiles, is in fact a bird. And it is one of the oldest, oldest animals that has stayed unchanged for hundreds of thousands of years since it evolved during the time of the dinosaurs. The other thing that sets it apart, the crocodile apart, from the rest of the reptile family is that it's capable of a bit more of internal control of its body temperature. So whilst it is still classified as an exotherm, and that it needs to go, for example, to bask in the sun. Because it lives such an aquatic existence within those rivers and pools, it does need some degree, because, and also because it's a very large animal, it does need a certain degree of control of its body temperature. And we tend to think of them as... disappeared there for a second and completely lost my train of thought actually I was about to tell you something very interesting about oh I was talking about the fact that we see them as primitive but in fact the, their design was so perfect the way in which they evolved was so perfect that it didn't need to change for the number of years that it's remained the same my goodness gracious I think at some point we need to start thinking about rain covers this wind rain covers we're gonna lose them that's a very good point from Vim. 
Our rain covers are locked away to sun. I'm more concerned about the lightning than I am about the rain. Although it hasn't started just yet, there's a, a yellow tinge to the sky. Beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Very atmospheric, but definitely a little bit. There's an anticipation to it. Oh well, we debate the pros and cons of our decision about our main cover. I So we're back in the area around Galago and Vuyatella and we've just come across a nice little group of kudu. And you can see a little male there with his little horn sticking out. Tiny two little babies about to come through. Hello, little fluff balls. Look at that. Okay. Hello, little ones. So, apparently the report we got that the Inkahumas were with the Birmingham's was incorrect. So, that has now led me to think that those Impala that Lex heard alarming during the day might have seen the lions north of the lodge. So, I've come back to this area and I'm giving it a really a good sort of second over. And I think the lions might be in there somewhere. But now, I'm very happy these kudu happen to be where they are. So if they spot the lines, they'll give that alarm call and we should be able to hear it. It might be a bit difficult with this gusting wind. And uh, there is a large storm approaching. I don't think it's going to rain just yet. I know Jamie wants to put rain covers on. I'm a little bit less worried. Let's have a look at it. I think it's still quite a distance away. But we'll see who's right. There it is. Rolling in from the west. On a positive note, if you're a lion or a leopard, tonight, if it's windy and rainy and dark, it's going to be a good night to catch something. <laughs> 